Hello and welcome to another edition, you could call it a Nate Poppin' Fresh edition. It was going to happen at some point or another of the Cubs Talk podcast. We're in the virtual studio powered by Points Bet. I am Layla Rahimi. I am joined by Nate Poppin, our producer from NBC Sports Chicago, and James Naveau, noted podcaster, noted uh, nice room decorator, noted producer, writer from NBC Chicago. You see him also on the Hawks Talk podcast. Big day for the Hawks Talk podcast crew. You should definitely check that out this week. Uh, So we are doing our last podcast before the actual regular season. All the games are in the books. And as we get ready, I also want to make this note. Huddle up because it is time to feel the power with points bet. With the points bet power hour, you can get boosted odds or bonus bets every single day between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. Central Time. It's like happy hour. Whether into hoops or hockey, home runs or hole in ones, once the clock hits 5 p.m., the power is in your hands. Use it wisely. Download the points bet app today using code SHYTALK, C H I T A L K, and set your watch. For Power Hour at 5 p.m. Central, points bet your move. We are done with spring training, and we get some big news as far as the Cubs making a big step on their roster and moving forward in what we've seen so far with the direction and the mission statement of this team. Guys, they locked down Nico Horner. It's a reported three-year, $35 million deal. Not I thought you were longest. talking about Luis Torrens uh, making the opening day roster. This is <laughs> congratulations uh, to Luis Torrens for making the opening day roster. That guy was <laughs> crushing the baseball. Mm-hmm. Like he was hitting it to straight, straight, straight away center. He was hitting it to like, if you have power, this is what you're doing today, hitting it to center. Or, you know, there was also Dansby Swanson chipping in with uh, two home runs in two games. So that wasn't bad either. But no, I was talking about Nico Horner. Uh, the reported three-year, $35 million deal. That was the last information we have regarding that reported deal as far as uh, the time we taped this podcast. So I would like to ask you two, what do you think about the Cubs making this move? To me, it's just another step in the same direction we've seen this team going. Uh, Nate, you're nodding, so I'm going to start with you. Yeah, I just love the uh, you know solidifying up the middle kind of like what they you know they just brought in Swanson at shortstop they've foreseeably locked up uh their double play combination until 2026 through 2026 and you know when you, when you look at what Horner does if he turns into this guy who's consistently like a four between four and five war player you're kind of getting them at a discount rate for 11 million dollars i mean when when you when you look at what the cubs will look like in that 2026 season or, you know, his, his final year of the, of the, uh, deal, they have about 70 million against the cap between basically four players, which is Horner, Tyone, uh, Swanson and Suzuki. Uh, I think it sets them up with, you know, I won't say not an excuse, but I think they, they have even more of a reason now to, to lock up another player, you know, in Hap, uh, which would be nice to see too. But yeah, I just, in general, I just love the, you know, the up the middle, so uh, solidifying up the middle. And if they have their future center fielder, say in, uh, in P- PCA in, in the waiting, that's, that's even, you know, even better for their future of the team. Nate, I, I, great. I, Thank you, James. <laughs> I, I'm of two minds of this contract. I think that only buying out one year of Nico Horner's uh, free agency was a little bit of an interesting decision by the Cubs. One would imagine that he probably was thinking he wanted to get to free agency at the age of 30, as opposed to doing it further down the line and agreeing to a longer term deal. So I was a little bit surprised at the shortness of the term thought maybe they'd throw on another year or two and maybe bump up the uh, total payout, of course. I think the, the, the money itself is totally fine. I think that buying out the arbitration years in that first year of free agency, I think the price tag was about right for that. So no qualms about that. The only other concern I have about the deal, if you want to call it a concern, is that Nico Horner 
His reputation is that of being a really solid contact hitter. We've seen that during his career. I will caution Cub fans that he has a career 277 batting average, and he's only played in 247 games. And I think that what Nico Horner needs to prove to me to make this deal worthwhile for the Cubs is he needs to show that he can be that consistent leadoff hitter that they have so sorely lacked, what, basically since Dexter Fowler was on this roster. I think the Cubs have cycled through probably more leadoff hitters than I own hats, which is saying something. So I think that they he needs to bump up his on-base percentage again this season. I think he needs to prove he can consistently stay on the field. Last season was the first time he played more than 50 games in a big league season. So I think that as long as he can prove that and he can get that OBP up, I think that the steel is going to look really solid for the Cubs. But I mean, you have to say with less than 250 big league games under his belt and approaching the age of 26, this is definitely a deal he's going to need to prove that, you know, he's worthy of. But I think at the end of the day, still a strong signing for the Cubs. I'm just interested to see how Horner reacts to this and how he, you know, kind of lives up to the expectations this kind of deal is going to put on him. I hate to start with the money guys when it comes to this type of contract but i really think that given how we've talked about the infielder key infielder shortstop whichever you want to say contracts dansby swanson obviously one of the big four in this offseason and how the overwhelming thought is that by the end of those contracts they will be such a value compared to how we're seeing contracts just go up and up and up that I think with this, it's going to be, relatively speaking, perhaps a drop in the bucket for the Cubs once the time comes where they have to think about it again. And that season you're talking about, technically, I think he's going to be 29 when it's up, entering that you know 30 season, like you said, James. But uh, I agree. It's the, it's the lack of uh, having the amount of games under his belt that makes you a little worried. Uh, it's, it's the optimism there. I feel like, in a way... You know, there's there was also optimism when they signed Swanson, just knowing once again, we've talked about his offensive numbers. The strikeout numbers spoke for themselves last year and knowing that there's a hope that that's not the finished product. But just really leaning into that concept of shore up the middle infield. This is who it's going to be. That spine of the defense principle. And I think you're right. I think Pete Crow Armstrong is the next domino to fall in that commitment they're making when it comes to telling you who that's going to be just up the middle. So to me, that's uh that, that speaks to their, I wouldn't call it obsession, but their, their definite stance on run prevention being what is of value currently to this team. I do think that Horner deserved the extension, even though we've only seen him in flashes do what he's done so far. I feel like it was enough to build on given the money to make sense, at least for both parties in the interim. Now, what happens once it's up? I'm hoping that a window is not closing for anyone in 2026. That's for sure. I would think that that's deep in the heart of some window that they're opening and really the upswing of perhaps at that point a playoff team. I I would think based on how they're constructing this, that that would be the case. What do you guys think about just the timing? Because I tend to think of it in contract window perspective. Dansby Swanson is what I'm going with here first. Yeah, I think, you know, you raise you raise a good point there with uh, what they already have on the books, you know, for that window. Uh, Swanson is kind of the only guy like long term, long term that is that is going to be, be beyond like the 27 ish season. Um, but I mean, if everything works out, you know, with prospects and every, like, like they hope with guys like, you know, Alcantara, PCA, yada, 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 um, they won't be spending, you know, a ton of money on, on those guys, you know, so you're, you're, you're kind of putting all your, all your eggs, I'd say in the, in the, in the up the middle infield, uh, defense with guys like Swanson and, and, uh, and Horner, um, my concern then is that you're you're looking at a team that really only has like one starting pitcher under contract, and you're already looking at you know upwards of eighty mil ish uh, spent. So I don't know. I, I I like I like that what it signals where they're headed. Uh, like 
obviously I don't think they're a contender yet this year or maybe even next year yet. Um, but yeah, I just, I just think it makes sense to, if you draft a guy in the first round and he, he performs on the field, even though yes, he, he hasn't been on the field as much as other guys have. I think it's a good sign that you're, you know, you're willing to go out there and, and bring that guy back and not just let a uh, first round pick, which you don't get that very, very many of walk away for, you know, nothing or, uh, or next to nothing. Well, I think we've seen the Cubs over the years have prioritized the development of those middle infield type guys, right? And they're willing to kind of cycle them around and move them around because basically if you can play defensively at shortstop, you can pretty much play anywhere on the infield is kind of the general axiom the Cubs have kind of bought into. And I think that even if Nico Horner at the end of this three years, the Cubs decide, you know, well, we're going to potentially move on. They'll inevitably have guys in the pipeline that are going to be able to fill that position the first guy that comes to mind for me is that at some point, a guy like Christian Hernandez could potentially come in here. Like he's been, feels like he's been hyped forever. I mean, we, we've been talking about this guy. It feels like for, you know, four or five years, and he's still probably three years away from contributing to the team, but still having him kind of, you know, in the future, this guy that has elicited some frankly incredible, you know, comparisons to guys like Alex Rodriguez, I think is absolutely crazy. So having that in the pipeline is really important with a deal like this, because you do have kind of that insurance. If Nico Horner goes out there and blows everybody away, earning the contract and then hitting the free agent market is a very desirable defensively sound middle infielder that can steal bases. He had 20 steals last season. I think that we tend to overlook that a little bit when we talk about Nico Horner. We do talk about the contact, talk about the defense. He's a stolen base threat too. And then with the limits on the number of you know throws you can make over to first base, the bigger bases this season, I think he and Dansby Swanson are going to have a field day running on some of these teams. And I think it really makes him more valuable as the leadoff hitter. And so my thought is, even if he's going to earn that contract in these three years, at least the Cubs do have some of that backfill available in their system. And I think they always prioritize that in the draft. And so I think that that's something really important to keep in mind as well when discussing at least the term of the contract and kind of the way the Cubs are constructing this thing moving forward. I think you're right about that. There are certain teams where you just know they like to have a certain position depth. And they build on that in the draft. And I think you're right. I think that the Cubs have shown that time and time again. Can I surprise you guys with a partial topic that you're prepared for, but that we didn't talk about before we started the show? No, no, of course not. As long as it's not Nick Madrigal, I'm okay. <laughs> it is not, but it is Ian Happ. Okay. Yeah. So our friend Maddie Lee from the Sun-Times wrote an article, and this is before the news about Nico Horner came out. And... Hap didn't have that extension agreement. And she quotes Jed Hoyer, and this was from the GM meetings in November. So hear this after we just talked about the previous news. Don't hold me to this, but I don't really love negotiating in spring training. He said that in November. The more I do it, the more I think it causes real tension. Guys want to start the season. I watch many deals fall apart in spring training. I just don't think it's a great way to start the season. Hmm. Ian Hap is aware. He saw what happened with Wilson Contreras last year. He saw what happened with Anthony Rizzo prior. I don't have a lot of optimism that something's going to get done ultimately. I mean, I haven't really had much optimism, even when they said they were talking about negotiating with you. With Ian Happ, excuse me, and he was on Burnsy and Holmes today on the score talking about how he's not going to put any hard deadlines on anything. And I do believe him when he says that, that he's willing to talk to the Cubs as the season gets underway. I'm also well aware of the fact that Ian Happ has the potential to be one of the more desirable free agents out in the market this coming off season in terms of outfield guys. And so I think that if he puts up another strong season, like a season compared to, you know, what he was able to do last year with the Cubs, I think that he could command a pretty solid salary. And with the depth that the Cubs have in terms of their outfield prospects, I think that they can pretty easily make the argument to themselves. All we have to do is move one of these center field prospects that we have, whether it's your Alcantara, your Brennan Davis, your PCA, all you're going to have to do is shift one of those dudes over to left field and Ian Happ's replaceable for a lot less money. And so I think that 
kind of the writing's been on the wall, I think, with Ian Happ, that the deal would really have to make sense for the Cubs to pull the trigger on it. And I'm I'm kind of with you, Layla, where I'm just not I'm not super optimistic that that's going to happen for Chicago. I always thought that the Nico Horner part of this was going to make a lot more sense to this team moving forward. And that's kind of the way that it's uh, played out. No, I totally agree with you guys. I think the writing's kind of been on the wall for, for Ian Happ. And I, I don't know, like you said, with the way that the market's going to gonna shake itself out going into next off season, I don't think it makes sense. I don't think it matches up well you know, with the, like, he's not going to give the Cubs some type of hometown discount if he's going to be a top three or top five outfield mm-hmm. you know, option for, for a team that's lacking and for a team that doesn't have, you know, the, the prospect capital that the Cubs do have uh, in the outfield. And yeah, I mean, you, you have to look at if you're, if you're, if you're Hoyer, um, you have to look at every position as, you know, weigh it out, who do we have waiting in the wings? What 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 can they produce against what you know we're 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 paying these proven guys that are you know the all star caliber type players of Ian Happ? But yeah, I mean the more the more time passes and the more you think about it, it really doesn't make sense that he's back with this team after after this season. I do want to follow up on that, Nate, and I kind of have to put this bluntly. If you're Jed Hoyer or Carter Hawkins with Ian Happ turning 30 years old next season, if he's commanding a five, six year deal in that kind of, you know, 20 mil a season range, do you really want to put that kind of money out for a guy like Ian Happ? And then I guess the follow up would be then if the Cubs aren't willing to do it, how likely is that another team is going to be desperate enough to do it? I think it's going to be a team that is they feel like they're one piece away, right, from potentially really taking a step forward. He is a gold glove caliber defender. It's for decent power. Like these are desirable traits. I just don't see the Cubs willing to go. Yeah, we'll give that dude six and one twenty. I just I don't see that happening with the Cubs. So I'm curious how you guys feel about that. (laughs) James, I'm sorry. I had to try the hand raising thing just because I thought it was effective. I think that the Cubs are actively. And we saw it last year with Hap and Wilson Contreras closing the door on that era. Like This is something that they put into motion. I go back to the U Darvish trade, of course. I think it's going to be 29, like 2097 before I feel like those prospects are going to come online. How dare I'm you smirch Owen Casey like that? That's true. Owen Casey's, <laughs> Owen Casey's shown up and he showed up for Canada, by goodness. Oh, but Canada. <laughs> I know he stood on guard for the, he really he did. did. Nice. But you know what I'm trying to say? It's, it's still a while for the majority of, of the people involved in that trade. And I'm, I feel like that was the beginning of the end of this for them, not for the players, but, or I mean, not for the Cubs, but like for the Cubs saying to the players, like we need to move on from this and have, mm-hmm. We talked to him. I spoke to him on that show about whether or not this was the end for him. And so to me, if that's the case, then you'd better get something back for him at the deadline. He was an all-star last season. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this not being a finished product. How long was it going to take before they thought it was going to be a finished product? There's a likelihood that somebody's getting traded at the deadline. That is not a part of my bold predictions, but I guess it kind of has to be now. So <laughs> trying to figure all of that out. But uh, I think it's it's worth discussing. Maddie Lee did a good job on that article. Strongly recommend you check it out on the Sun-Times if you get the chance. James, you've done some real work. I feel like you've been putting out a news story every like 20 minutes when we're trying to figure out who the Cubs opening day roster is going to be. Uh, I strongly recommend people checking that out on NBCChicago.com as well. Um, but it's, it's just something that I think we need to keep in mind. We're going to be having this discussion over and over again, Mm -hmm. but if Hap has the same kind of season that he had last year, and I don't see a really big argument as to why he wouldn't, I think it's, it's definitely worth discussing. Does the power dip concern you at all? He only had 17 home runs last season. No, because he still did enough to produce, like think about Think about other teams and how low their home num- home run numbers were. Obviously, I'm not talking about the Yankees or the Phillies here. Mm-hmm. But when you consider the majority of teams in the middle of the league, 
I think with him, those numbers are enough, given everything else, for a team who's making a playoff run to say, we will give something for this person. Mm. And then maybe they're the ones saying later, this gives us a likelihood that's higher that we sign him in the offseason. Perhaps it is wishful thinking, but I feel like if that's a conclusion, then maybe everyone should get something out of it, especially after what happened last year. I would hate to be him at the trade deadline months from now and go through the same thing. For the like, second I, year I in just, a row. And, and that's not just him, by the way. I would feel that way about anyone. But uh, that that couldn't have been easy. And I feel like when I was talking to him about it, you could tell in his voice it wasn't easy. Did he handle it really well? Yes. But the trade deadline is a stressful time for players. And I don't think we convey that enough at times. So I just wanted to pass that along. Um, all right. Now. Is a segment that everybody's been waiting for since I started this podcast and threw in the secret topic. Predictions. We want to make some season predictions. And on our list, Cubs wins, World Series prediction, bold prediction, and NL Central prediction. I want to say what the proposed bold prediction was, but I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah, you can go ahead and say it, Lil, if you really want to. If you're <laughs> actually me. making the prediction, oh, now, it was, that was a no, joke. The rubber's hitting the road now, dude. <laughs> no, I was so we were like on the on our group thread for the podcast. How bold do you want the prediction? <laughs> and then Nate just Not that tore bold. the cover got, off the ball. It got straight up spicy, is what happened. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. <laughs> no, no, it, it was facetious. Yes, uh, it okay. was. It was a it, joke at the very but let's least. Just, but... Let's just say that the words 200 hits were uttered <laughs> and Freddie Freeman had 199 last year. So we got real bold. <laughs> yep, that was um, that was a moment in time that I'm going to treasure forever. <laughs> James's brain was permanently fried. He wants yep. to quit this podcast. <laughs> And we will never speak of it again. Thank God. I feel like the end of uh, Billy Madison. <laughs> I reward you no points. And may God have mercy on your soul. Cubs wins. Thank you. Zips, Zips has him at 78. I don't think that's enough. Ooh. I'm going to go with 83. Mm. They outperform the their... <laughs> yes. I was going to say, is this the part where we go 83? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Only if you want to in your <laughs> hearts. But I really think that they uh, they outperformed their projection last year. I don't see why that wouldn't be the case this year, especially when you consider that uh, people are definitely trending in the right direction. I think even more so than prior to spring training when a lot of this stuff came out. I like Zips. I'm not even going to bring up Pakoda. <laughs> we try to balance them against each other. But uh, that is that is my prediction that this is an above five hundred team. Okay. Um, uh, I'm gonna go one one less. I'm gonna say eighty two. So yeah, I'm right there with you. Uh, I think, you know, the, the Zips and Pakotas of the world. Obviously, they're they're uh, conservative uh, to begin with with most teams. Uh, they usually don't predict most players hitting over like twenty five ish home runs, which is kind of crazy in this day and age. Uh, and especially given what's going to happen with, you know, the rule changes and, and pitch clock and, and banning the shift and all those things, uh, I find it hard to believe that uh, offense doesn't go up overall. But anyway, uh, long story short, yeah, I think 82 wins. I think the pitching staff is much deeper, uh, much younger, more uh, diverse. And uh, yeah, every, I, I just I like everything about this team more than I did last season uh for obvious reasons uh and I, I just don't see how they don't get to like all you have to do is get hot for a couple weeks in april build build a nice little cushion and then go 500 the rest of the year so you know it's pretty much all, it all you, or all you have to do is hit a cold streak in june when you can't hit the ball out of the ballpark and fall out of contention and trade away your best players that could also happen with that hasn't happened <laughs> So my, I'm going to say points bets, our sponsors love points bet in the virtual points bet studio that we're in. They have Five their over under hour hour. at 77.5 wins. I have put my money where my mouth is with this and I have put it on the over. 
However, I only think the Cubs are going to win 79 games. I think that their pitching staff has improved. I really do like the moves that they've made in that area. I think Hayden Wisniewski is poised to have a really strong campaign. The two things I worry about with this team, the relative lack of power hitting that they have, I don't see them being able to score runs in that way and manufacturing runs can be tricky when you have some higher strikeout guys in the fold like the Cubs do, like with your Patrick Wisdoms, et cetera. They're going to get probably very little offense from their catcher position. No offense to Jan Gomes, who led the team in home runs during spring training. The The offensive concerns, I think, are very real with this team. I think they've been gotten into at length by a lot of different people. I also worry about having a pitching staff that is so heavily reliant on a quality defense behind them when you have no idea who's going to be a regular starting third baseman. Yes, you have a solid center fielder in Cody Bellinger, but what happens if that dude's batting 150 and you cannot start him every day? That shifts everything around on that defense. What happens if Nico Horner or Dansby Swanson goes down with an injury? I feel like having a pitching staff that can get outs in versatile ways is really important. And I don't think the Cubs have a lot of swing and miss stuff in that rotation. All of that being said, I do think they're going to get boosts from guys like Aiden Wisniewski. I do think Matt Mervis comes up eventually and makes an impact at first base. I don't think the Cubs are going to take some giant step back this season and fall below that 77 and a half win total. I just don't see a barring a lot of people playing really well and far out seeding expectations. I just don't see them getting too far past the 500 mark. So I'm going to stick with 79. Well, I feel like we're in a very tight little bell curve of basic, but I've given the team's performance. I would say that all those things are, are pretty expected and you're right like this is a team that can make some big moves at the deadline and trade away some people who are really making hay for them knowing that they're not going to be a part of this future that we just spent the entire first half of the show talking about (laughs) all right it is time for world series predictions and since i went first i will not go first next time nate go ahead uh i think this is kind of Finally, the Padres year to win it, and oh, uh, I do have a prediction. <laughs> and I kind of like the dark horse uh, Mariners to be there with them. So, whoa! I just really I, I, I like a lot of what's going on with that team right now. So, yeah. yeah. But Padres, I mean, they you can only you can only throw money at something so long for so long and so many times till it has to work out at some point. I mean, I would think unless Tatis gets picked for another 80 games, then maybe it doesn't happen. But yeah. Where, are you thinking that it happens like the day after he comes off that I, suspension? <laughs> I he's he's Tatis. I don't know. He's capable of a lot of things. So that's that's fair. Uh, all right, James. Since everybody kind of knows mine already, given my reaction, that was ridiculous. Well, I have neither the Padres nor the Mariners in my World Series prediction. I am going I am going with a repeat of the 1993 World Series. I am going with the Toronto Blue Jays over the Philadelphia Phillies in the World Series. I love the moves the Blue Jays have made in the last few years. Their lineup is absolutely stacked. Having guys, you know, in that lineup like your Matt Chapman's, your Bo Bichette's, your Kevin, even your Kevin Kiermeyer and George Springer in the outfield. And then you look at what they've been able to do, shoring up their pitching rotation as well. I just I think the Blue Jays. Yeah, it's a really tough division having to play with the New York Yankees. Yeah, the Seattle Mariners have made some incredible moves. Yeah, the Houston Astros are still the flipping defending champions. It's going to be a tough slog through the American League, but I just really see the Blue Jays taking that step forward this year. And honestly, I love what the Philadelphia Phillies have done this year too. I mean, adding Trey Turner, fairly big deal when you really consider it. They've shored up a lot of pieces, spent a lot of money. I think they're going to have a tough time with the Mets and the the Braves, of course, in the East. And lest we forget, the Padres are sort of good out in the West. So it will not be an easy road, but man, that Phillies lineup is so stacked and they've done so many good things. I think that, you know, they're probably a compelling argument to make for at least seven or eight teams to win the World Series this season. I'm just I'm riding with Canada. I'm riding with the Toronto Blue Jays. I 
I'm a crazy person who also thinks that money solves a lot of problems in life <laughs> and in in uh in Major League Baseball. So I thought since I've been trying to predict them going to the World Series for the last, I think, two seasons, I'm going to stick with it. I think the Yankees come out of the American League. <laughs> and I think they play the Padres and the Padres win. The National League is, is to me, the upper echelon of the National League is the upper echelon of baseball outside of maybe the Astros. And that still doesn't even make sense as to why I'm picking the Yankees. But I just feel like they're going to make trades that they need to make at the deadline this season to try to try to move them across if they don't have enough. They did, of course, sign Judge to that massive deal. Uh, I think it was a savvy pickup to get Carlos Rodon. I would not be surprised at all to see their pitching staff uh, perform the way we thought it was going to from wire to wire in the regular season, not that people don't get injured. And then as far as the Padres are concerned, you can't argue with the star power that they've added in the offseason. And then they were like, oh, yeah, let's get guys like Michael Walker. And to me, those are detailed signings where they just get another pitching arm if they need him. You know, people who are available to other teams might say that's our fourth or fifth starter, maybe third on some teams. And they're like, we're just going to have him for depth. So it's those kind of moves that uh, famously angered Rob Manfred. But also make me think that once again, if they have to get something else at the deadline, that they're going to be the team to do it. But I just can't see the Yankees standing pat if they if they need something else, given how much money they've invested in this team, to say we don't we don't have a chance to beat the Astros. I still think at that point it's going to be them doing everything they possibly can out of the American League to try to make it to that World Series and get back. So that was my logic. <laughs> is it uh, the most sound? No, but I just, I feel like the Yankees have been close for a couple of years now. And just, this just might be the year where Cashman has enough and, and makes an extra move mid season. You know, who could be a perfect move for them at the deadline. Ian Happ. Dun, dun, dun. Boom. There you go. That's a very good point. Uh, now it is time for bold prediction. Nathan Poppin, is that your bold prediction? No, no. Uh, I'm actually going to go with Hayden Wisniewski leading the starters in strikeouts. And I know that's not much of a limb to go out on, but I think he, he amasses enough innings this season where he actually, uh, kind of, you know, starts stacking, stacking strikeouts. And, uh, and he's kind of, you know, as, as James alluded to, he's kind of one of the only, uh, swing and miss guys in the rotation. And I think that's a, it's a kind of a perfect, uh, uh, equation for him to actually lead the team and strike or lead the, uh, starting staff in strikeouts. Oh yeah. It looks like a bold prediction. I would say probably in September. And then we got going. If you, if you want to kick it back to the beginning of September, we're like, Hey, that's kind of bold, but now it makes sense. Doesn't it? Definitely has the best swing and miss stuff on the staff, I think. I think that he could have a really strong season for the Cubs. And so I love where Nate's head's at with that. I am firmly on the Hayden Wisniewski bandwagon for sure. So you get my seal of approval, dude. That's a good one. Um, I have two. One of them may not be spicy and bold enough for you guys, but we will see. I think that Matt Mervis is on the Cubs roster by May 15th. I'm going to throw that out there. I think that they're going to be dissatisfied enough with their production at first base, not naming names, Eric Hosmer, <laughs> who may potentially not be living up to the billing. And I think they're going to want an infusion of offense. And I'm thinking he's going to continue the strong hitting he showed last season. So that's number one. The other one is Marcus Stroman will not be in the rotation past the trade deadline. That's my other one. I think that if the Cubs are out of contention and with the fear of that opt out clause potentially looming, I could easily see the Cubs moving a guy like that because I think he would net you a really nice return. I don't think they're going to be willing to part ways with Justin Steele. I think they're going to look at a guy like that as a future kind of building block. I think that they probably are going to feel, they're of course going to feel the same way about Hayden Wisniewski having just given up Efros to get him. I think that he'll still be around. And I think with guys like Assad and Killian, you know, knocking at the door, I think they look at the guy that's going to get them the maximum return, and I just immediately think Marcus Stroman. So that is my second uh, spicy take for this. I don't think it's necessarily wrong, and it's not a knock on Stroman. It is an absolute compliment to his value 
and just a nod to how that deal was constructed. Mm -hmm. Uh, My bold prediction is some wishful thinking for one Cody Bellinger to have a comeback year. Do I think he's going to have the 2019 whiz bang offensive numbers? No, (laughs) but I predict that uh, Cody Bellinger, my bold prediction is 30 home runs for Cody Bellinger. Whoa. Mm. That's yep. pretty spicy, Layla. That is spicy. That's overconfident. And that's very hopeful. <laughs> and uh, and I don't think that he's going to bat 305 either like he did in 2019. But I uh, I think if, if Patrick Wisdom can come away with, what, 25, that it's not crazy to think that Cody Bellinger, if he has a change of scenery that benefits him or if he is uh is one of the hitters who's favored by the new pitch clock rules and maybe pitchers aren't doing max effort every pitch against him that he could at least uh come back to that 2019 form a little bit so that was my bold prediction for cody bellinger the logical it's follow-up to that is cody bellinger gonna hit all 30 of those home runs with the cubs Hmm. Dun, or, dun, dun. or will he be traded at the deadline and will they bring up a guy like a Brendan Davis or if he still my beating heart, maybe give PCA a look? Is that what we're maybe I thought thinking? about that too. I thought maybe they call up PCA this season and I thought about that bold prediction. I Yeah, yeah I, given his contract, it makes a lot of sense if they traded him, if he's hitting on pace for 30 home runs in a mm-hmm. season. Huh. All right. I didn't that... think about step two there. I really didn't. <laughs> and then my <laughs> other like, What's bold. My the the other thing that this inspired for Cody Bellinger hitting 30 home runs. I would assume Layla that you're thinking he would lead the Cubs in that category. I mean, about... most well, most likely, right? Yeah, you he, would. Think. He would be. So instead, I'll ask Nate and I'll put him to the fire on this. Who's leading the Cubs in home runs, Nate? Actually, uh, I like Mancini. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, also a bold. One. I, th- I think I think the, the if you look at those numbers from when they uh they extended the wall and they pretty much turned Camden Yards into a uh a gigantic uh I don't know. Uh, it, it's almost like a, a a football stadium like Petco. They turned it into old nuts. Petco. Yeah, yeah, basically. It, it's ridiculous what they did. Petco pre defenses in. So so when you so when you you know when you look at what he did in that park and especially uh, to the field that he did it to, it kind of makes sense that uh, you know some of those balls would wind up in the basket or in the uh, bleachers at Wrigley. So yeah, nice. I like that. All right, I am going to go with uh, Dansby Swanson. I think that last season he showed an improved power approach. I think that he'll hit a few more at, at Wrigley Field this season. Benefit from the aforementioned basket and I think that with Cody Bellinger maybe getting shipped out at the trade deadline and maybe with Trey Mancini not necessarily playing every single day I'm gonna go with uh Dansby maybe lead the team with something like 26 I think that's that sounds about right to me I know 30 is really bold whatever it's out (laughs) there it's a bold prediction it's what we're here for dude no nobody said Suzuki no I know and I thought about that too I did. Oh, but bleeps I, are I'm, finicky, man. Exactly. I'm still waiting to see what, is, what his health is. Yep. Who's winning the NL Central? Should we all say it at the same time? Yeah. Card- the Reds. One, the two, Reds. three. <laughs> Cardinals. Yeah. Boo. Boo. Yeah. I like their I, offense a lot. A yeah. lot. They are highly ranked in a lot of the power ranking articles mm-hmm. that are coming out. Well, I mean, you have the reigning, you know, National League MVP. You've got some dude named Nolan Arenado. You've got Jordan Walker that's coming into the mix. Lars Newtbar's in there. Like, you well, oh, and then they added Wilson Contreras, too. Yeah. Man, that's a lot of offense. That's Somebody's so- hitting 30 home runs on that team for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fortunately, the Cubs only had to play at Bush uh, Stadium once this season, so... You only only get subjected to the St. Louis crowd once if you're Cubs fans. That's hmm. that's uh that's something that's like really going to George shortage take some uh, time really. to reset. <laughs> a shortage, if you will. <laughs> is there such a thing? Oh, there is. Oh yeah, George shortage. Yeah, less mullets too. Anyway, yeah. Ooh, Nate from the top rope. 
Sorry. Is that a bold prediction? I don't think so. Been to a lot of games. So, yeah. I think Nate actually said if uh, Trey Mancini doesn't lead the Cubs in home runs, he's going to craft <laughs> his hair into a mullet. I think I heard him well, it's, say that. It's actually not possible. So, yeah. I'm not, <laughs> yeah. That's what you say. Yeah. I, we I can have, figure out something. Yeah. I have, I have cap hair. So, yeah. We're, uh, wow. yeah. Like David Kaplan <laughs> hair? Or yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you meant ball cap hair. <laughs> I like totally how Layla didn't. and I went completely different directions <laughs> with that. <laughs> Maybe we just make James's hair mullet. His wife is a hairdresser. You know what? She would not be opposed to that. And besides, when I grow my hair out, it gets super curly. So that would be a wild sight, I will say. Well, I think I might get fired if I try to mullet on TV. <laughs> This is not an open discussion. I'm going to go. I'll go ask a Kemi after we're done with this uh, podcast. Hey, so we had this podcast and <laughs> it got a little out of control. Layla started hitting the yada, sauce yada, maybe yada. a little bit. Uh, and by know. sauce, we mean she said Cody Bellinger is going to hit 30 home runs. <laughs> I'm, you know, people are going to use this against me now because context is is non-existent when it comes to this stuff. I mean, at least we didn't say last season. I don't at least at least we uh guys at least we didn't say the extra bold. Uh yeah. Oh yeah. Nikki <laughs> Nikki Nikki 200 strikes. Is that what that was? Uh Yeah, man. I don't I just I'm looking up his stats right now. Bellinger had ni- like, 19 home runs last season by the way. Oh dear. That's uh that's that's near half. Well, well well, <laughs> limited at bats, though. It's not like he had a full uh, season's worth of at bats. Oh, wait, he yeah. had 504. He kind of did. Well, I mean, he played in 144 games. <laughs> hit for a hit for a lovely 210. Mm. Up from 165 the year before the Dodgers. But he only played 95 games. In. <laughs> 2019 was a long, long time ago. It was. Many, many, many. That's moons. cool. Don't stop believing or something. <laughs> You know what? We did ask for bold predictions, though, and I think that him kind of resurrecting his career with the Cubs and hitting more home runs and benefiting from the changes and shift rules. I think you've got some at least some factual basis behind that, even if Nate and I have uh, professed some skepticism of it. I mean, it'd be be great. Some. I mean, but it was just a bold. That's the point of the bold prediction. Yeah. But additionally, you guys talk about places where the ball might not fly. Dodger Stadium is, is not kind to that. You have <laughs> yeah. to be very, very good. I'm also surprised that nobody said the Dodgers in the uh, World Series prediction. Well, I'm waiting till next year when they have Shohei Otani and they blow yeah. the doors off of everybody. Yeah, That's, uh, every time you say it, it gets more realistic to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to happen. It's just... There's maybe that's a bold prediction. This is actually, the that's not bold. Of, actually, no, we, we should ask is Shohei Otani traded by the deadline this year? Ooh, Ooh. I say yes. Ooh. Hmm. I'm going to say no, because I don't think a team's going to give up the capital required to get him as a rental. Yeah. I think, I think they'd rather take their swing at him in free agency. I would yeah. agree. Um, I can't even initially. imagine what that, what that type of, you know, trade package would look like. Well, um, teams tried to hint it at it last year. Teams tried to say like, oh yeah, we, we were in the mix on it or whatever. But you never got an answer as to what that would have been. You know who you trade Sho- Shohei Otani for? Guy like Mike Trout. Wait. Oh wait, can't do that. <laughs> uh, and on that note, I think it's uh, it's time to cut us off before people think we're being serious. <laughs> Thanks for joining this edition of the Cubs Talk Podcast. We'll see you for an actual in-season version next week. Amazing.